Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Clarifying Catholicism. Ordinarily, we explore theological topics, but in this series, we investigate the writings of, in my opinion, the most important little-known philosopher of the 20th century, Javier Zubiri. This is not a theological series at all whatsoever. However, if you want to do good theology, you'll need a good philosophical backbone first. So if you want to check out the rest of the episodes in this series, check the link in the description. Without further ado, on to the show. As always, let's review what we've discussed so far. At the beginning of our quest for knowledge, we apprehend things primordially, or simply as a unified thing, meaning we don't relate them to other things. I see a forest and I think forest, nothing else. Not forest is big, nor forest is a collection of trees, just forest. Humans and animals both experience simple primordial apprehension. Once we begin relating things to each other, something only humans can do, we are formalizing content into reality via the ulterior apprehension. There are two types of ulterior apprehensions. The first is called logos. Logos is what connects primordial apprehensions together. I apprehend tree, I apprehend green. My logos connects them, so I can say tree is green. Logos is a physical function of our physical senses and organs. This is opposed to the classical understanding of logos as a spiritual director of the universe that governs the physical world. And because logos is a physical apprehension that involves physical senses, it is dynamic, not static. The network of things connected by logos contributes to reality. Reality is shaped by all of our physical senses and apprehensions, including logos. This makes reality an imminent and physical rather than spiritual thing. And like all physical constructs, realities are dynamic. I have my reality and you have your reality. Now that might make it seem like reality is relativistic, it's not. Remember that just as we don't control our own physical pain receptors when we stub our toes, we also don't control our physical sense of towards that determines the connections between things that is made via the logos. Zubiri defines reality as formalized content. All of our senses that formalize, including what are traditionally referred to as mental senses, not only respond to, but are shaped by real content. This makes reality dynamic, but dependent on the real. Okay, now we're all caught up. Now let's talk about judgment. Before we understand judgment though, we must understand unreality. And we will count on a simple example to illustrate just what that is. Let's say you've never seen a match before in your life. And I show you one without striking it against a matchbox. Perhaps you would apprehend the unlit match as a light, thin, wooden, and pointy thing. So you think that this match is just some fancy looking toothpick. You pick one up and you use it as a toothpick. All of a sudden, I strike it against a matchbox and it lights on fire. This new apprehension causes you to mentally step back. Suddenly, you aren't so sure about the properties of this piece of wood that you thought was a toothpick. Remember that reality is defined as formalized content. Before seeing that piece of wood strike against the box and catch fire, you formalized that content as a toothpick. Upon apprehending that it is much more than a toothpick, that formalization breaks. At first, when you apprehended a piece of small pointy wood, you placed it in the field and connected it via logos to toothpick. But now that you've seen what happened to that piece of wood that caught fire, that comfy connection drawn by Logos is shaken. Is this really a toothpick? If it is, could it be that your understanding of how wood works is totally wrong? If not, what could this piece of wood really be? This breakdown, this questioning, this doubt of that connection between wood and toothpick, the dismantlement of previously formalized content organized by the Logos is called unreality. Basically, unreality occurs when we are forced to reformalize content in reality. Unreality has three moments. Disrealization is when a thing is dislodged from reality. It is when you are aware that what you thought was a fancy looking toothpick wasn't really a toothpick at all. 
The second moment is actualization of reality in our primordial apprehension. This is when you try to reorient a thing in reality by guessing what it could be. It's also called an explanation. Perhaps the toothpick was lit by some magical powers I store in my fingers. Or perhaps it was lit because it was a hot day. These various options of how the apprehension can be resituated in the rest of reality is called what might be. But then, one option seems to answer your question. What if the tip on the end of this toothpick looking thing had some chemicals in it and it reacted once it was struck against the matchbox? This seems most likely so you've attained a free realization of reality, which is the third and final moment of unreality. Finally, we arrive at judgment. The whole process of settling on a might be is called a judgment, and that judgment is dependent on the real's ability to convince us of which of these possible might be's is viable. For example, if I thought water might have been what caused the match to light, dunking water on it would cause me to discard that option. A key point that Zubiri makes is that a judgment always concerns apprehensions things that have already happened. The constellation of reality, as in the connections between things, has already been formed. Judgment doesn't form those connections, it merely affirms them. That said, judgments don't always concern the relationship between two things. That was a mistake of traditional metaphysics. In traditional metaphysics, judgments are usually associated with the soul confirming a propositional statement about two things, such as fire is hot. Zubiri states that this isn't the case though. Not all judgments involve two things. In fact, the most basic judgments, since judgments are merely affirmation of a thing's reality, involve one thing. Before we can make a judgment about fire causing heat, we make a judgment that that fire even exists. This is called a positional judgment. It's when you affirm fire or hot. A propositional judgment is when a thing is affirmed in relation to another thing without qualifying their relationship to each other. Fire hot. You affirm the reality of both fire and heat without directly relating them to each other. Finally, a predicate of judgment involves positional verbs. It positions or orients the things to each other. Fire is hot. The is in this sentence expresses three things. It expresses the event of feeling heat, the existence of a connection between fire and heat, and the nature of the relationship of fire being hot. Judgment is an intellective moment, and it's one that doesn't lead to satisfaction. Rather, it generates more questions. So when you make a judgment, the judgment generates what Zubiri calls an intentional expectation. So you've figured out that the matchbox caused the match to light. But why did this happen? Is the matchbox itself magic? Or is it a chemical reaction? If so, what chemicals are involved? Why do those chemicals behave the way they do? How do those chemicals interact with other objects? What is the molecular composition of those chemicals? Could you find those chemicals in other things? Is it bigger than a bread box? See how a judgment leads to more and more questions. In a certain sense, the more you know, the less you know. Let's review. Before you even make a predicate of judgment, you make a positional judgment. You feel heat. This judgment that you feel heat generates a question as to what could be causing it. So you propose this judgment. You feel the heat in relation to another judgment you make that you see fire. But you wonder what the relationship between heat and fire could be. This question compels you towards a predicate of judgment that fire causes heat or that it is hot. And even after this predicate of judgment, you might ask why the fire causes heat to which you could give another predicate of judgment that the fire is made of chemicals that cause heat. From there you could ask questions about what the chemicals are made of and so on. The point is that our judgments begin from basic observations about the real and lead us to ask an infinite horizon of questions about reality. The questions generated by judgment require evidence to be satisfied and those evidences are provided by the real. Basically, judgments answer questions, but those answers demand even more answers. Thus, we arrive at the infinite horizon of knowledge. Next episode, we will take a step into the heart of intellective activity, which is truth itself. Until then, have a great day. God bless you.